joining us for today's today's webinar um and we're just going to mark time shortly because we, you you're kind of joining us by zoom which is brilliant as you've joined us before you know you'd be able to take part in the poll questions very shortly we'll be joined by our facebook live listeners um and once we we've got them joining us we'll be able to get going so a very warm welcome and thank you very much for joining us whether you're joining us by zoom or by Facebook Live. It's great to have you for what is the final in our series, our summer series, focusing around equine mental well-being. And delighted to bring these series of webinars to you in in conjunction with the University of Nottingham. Now uh, we've possibly saved the best till last because today we welcome Andrew McLean, who has written numerous books and papers on science and ethics. Of horse training. We were also we welcome John Frankham, seven times national hunt champion jockey, and our own Caroline Hurd, assistant farm manager of Bellwade Farm in Aberdeenshire. Now, as before, these the success of these webinars is very much to make it a two-way conversation. So when we get to the QA uh, in the third part of the session, then please do feel free to put your questions in on the uh, QA function on Zoom or on the comments function on Facebook. We also, if you're joining us by Facebook, please do share the live video. And I hope you'll really enjoy tonight's webinar. And this is the fourth in a series of equine mental well-being webinars. But indeed, all of the webinars we've run since last June are available on our YouTube channel. So do please take a look at it, them there and also share them with your friends and colleagues. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, then please do uh, contact us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org if you have suggestions on what we might cover in future webinars. Now we are going to take a short break um, after this webinar and we will be starting again in early November and we'll be running uh, fortnightly webinars through the winter and on the 3rd of November we'll be kicking off with the imitable Russell Mackenzie Guire from Centaur Biomechanics whose research is relevant to all who ride horses and whose presentations I can assure you are always informative and extremely entertaining. But back to tonight's webinar, first off Andrew is going to enjoy, um, introduce a presentation uh, on an overview of equine mental well-being past, present and in future. And then we are going to uh, open up a panel discussion with John and Caroline to explore this whole topic further. And then that's when you will then come in. Uh, we'll then throw the floor open to questions. To, uh, so please do feel free to send those through uh, via Zoom or via Facebook. So um, as before, we'd love to get you involved just to kick off. So the, the, the first poll question for this evening is going to come up and it's uh, compared with when you were first worked with horses, is the importance in your view of equine mental well-being now better appreciated by the majority of horse owners? There's three options there. Yes, the importance is generally now better appreciated. Overall, there's been no change or indeed if you think it's actually less appreciated. Now, you can join um, those uh, responses if you're on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, by all means, have a chat on the comments function. But unfortunately, you can't join actually the, 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 the poll uh, answers. So next time, do join us by Zoom. But remember, your answer is completely anonymous. It's just to give us a feel for who's joining us this evening. And as ever, you know, there's no necessary right or wrong answer. Now, whilst you're answering that question, I'll just give you a little bit of um, an introduction um, about Welltour's welfare, which means I have to share my screen, which always a huge struggle for me uh, but there we go so that's the uh, presentation for this evening and there's the first panel question as you or the poll question which I should have shared with you already um, but for World Horse Welfare many of you will know us we're a charity founded in 1927 that at its heart is sort of to improve the horse human partnership we support we support responsible use of horses in sport run the largest equine rescue and rehoming scheme in Britain and one of our pillars along with many of our partners is education and of course that's what tonight is all about and I'm as I mentioned previously delighted that we're bringing this webinar to you in conjunction with the University of Nottingham which is a, um, a, a veterinary school founded in 2000 and six and very much at the heart it has a the student gets hand-on experience of animals from day one of the course and the curriculum has an emphasis on handling techniques that promote good equine mental well-being in a veterinary in the environment 
So back to tonight's um, webinar. The aim of all of our webinars is to focus on topics that support owners. And today's webinar, as mentioned, is all about equine well-being, past, present and future. And among the topics we'll cover will be how equine management and training have changed over time and may continue to evolve, the factors that affect, affect equine mental well-being and the barriers to widespread appreciation of equine mental well-being and how also horse owners can make a difference to their owners to their own horses and equine mental being i can't even say it, equine mental well-being as well but before i introduce um, andrew if basil can give us the answer to the poll question to see what kind of a so great to see um over four-fifths of you have yes the importance of equine mental well-being is generally better understood so that's uh, very positive obviously what we haven't asked though is whether we've gone far enough and i would imagine many of you would think of of course we haven't so it's great to, to welcome andrew and now I'll, oh hey, there you go um no i can't even do this tonight um to, to andrew who had trained initially in zoology but uh, has a, a cv which is rich and uh, amazing that he represented in australia in eventing i didn't actually realize he had ridden to grand prix level in in show jumping and dressage he is ceo of equitation Equit Science International, and most relevantly tonight, a co-founder of the International Society for Equitation Science. Now, there is one thing that you might not know about Andrew, and that is that he is fascinated by all creatures, as you can see by the photo, including birds. And since the age of eight, he has kept pigeons, which to him embody gentleness, beauty, agility, and freedom. Andrew's pigeons, and he has 26 right now, are always free to fly wherever they like, and he loves watching them. He does recognise, though, that not everyone likes pigeons. Well, Andrew, I certainly do like pigeons. I, amazing, I was at an animal war memorial service yesterday, and the, the role of pigeons in, in the war, especially the Second World War, is extraordinary. So you certainly have a, a fan in me. Um, Andrew, over to you. Right, thanks very much, Rolly. I'll just get my screen organized. I've almost forgotten what to do now. Um, <laughs> Join the club. I think this is right. Oh, sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> I don't worry. I'll do it again. Uh, now, I got strict instructions yesterday on how to do this for my daughter. So, there you go. How's that? Yeah. I yeah. think that's, is that pretty much right? You're good to go. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I think this is the most exciting uh, presentation I've ever put together, um, from certainly from my perspective. So, I'll move on because it's quite a quite a rich background we have in uh, coming to the way we understand horses uh, as we do now. So the very first question was, what has changed in equine management and training for better or for worse in the last hundred years? And I think in many respects, we need to go even beyond the hundred years to know um, how we actually even got to that first hundred years, because when we look at the way horses were treated in the Middle Ages, for example, we often think of it as rather brutal. But in fact, the church and the courts um, had quite a lot to say about animal, um, animal rights in the sense that um, even animals would be taken to court because they were thought to be culpable. Animals that were represented on Noah's Ark were um, given special privilege. And for example, if grasshoppers um, destroyed crops, then they could be killed because they were never on the ark, apparently. But field mice, on the other hand, uh, apparently there was a, a trial in Tyrol in 1519 of, of field mice. I don't know whether it's one or the whole lot. And um, because they'd been destroying crops and they were, they were banished. But in line with this banishment, they also had to be given um, an abode where they could be safe from dogs and cats. And also they gave them a two or three week um, uh, respite so that the young could uh, travel safely. And so the pregnant mice could um, also um, be fit to travel. So 
why I'm telling you this, it was is because it was thought that animals were cul culpable and knew what they were doing. And that's very much part of the narrative today that we see. And so more recently, um, we moved into a, uh, an era of postmodernism, which was basically the uh, 18th century French Enlightenment at its height, where God was pretty much sidelined and relegated to a much minor, more minor role. And Immanuel Kant, famously announced separe ord, meaning um, have the courage to use your own understanding, which of course rings true today because that's what people are doing. They're uh, cherry picking and um, using their own cognitive bias to uh, describe their world concerning vaccinations and all sorts of other things, but also including the animal mind and how we see animals. And so that's the general uh, motto of the, of the enlightenment. And then in more recent times, we see the influence of the current post-truth era, which was championed by Ralph Keynes in 2004. And in post-truth, emotions are more important than facts. And that is where we pretty much are now. Now, we can see that in social media where, you know, the um, people click on certain things. Uh, and if there's enough clicks, it often leads to strong pressures for changes in legislation. So social media really is the wild west of media in many respects. Everybody has an opinion and everybody feels entitled to have opinion, but some people believe that being entitled to having an opinion is a logical fallacy because opinions are subjective and there's also a great degree of uncertainty with opinions. And as Harlan Ellison said, no one is really entitled to be ignorant. And I think Obama said something the same that, you know, along the lines of we're not entitled to our own facts. So that is a, beef, a brief background to today's world. Excuse me if I'm a little scratchy because it is not quite, well, it's just after five o'clock in the morning here in my country. Um, now, moving on to, is that, yeah, sorry, moving on to science. Um, science has made big inroads in the last 10 years in terms of uh, or the last 100 years in terms of nutrition, density, <laughs> dentistry, healthcare, and especially in the area of veterinary, uh, veterinary health. But science hasn't always helped us much to understand the horse's mind because there was a great um, dispute between psychology on the one hand, which included the behaviorists in North America, and ethologists in Europe championed by people like Conrad Lorenz and Nico Tinbergen. And one of the problems was that uh, the ethologists believed that you could never really get to understand the mind of an animal by putting it into an experimental situation. And the other side argued that, well, how can you ever get to um, do these experiments on animals, in particularly in terms of uh, cognitive ones, when you're uh, hiding in a, um, a tent amongst a herd, you can only really see what you see and then infer what you infer. So there was this big uh, chasm between them, but then it was brought together in the last 20 years in the field of uh, science called um, cognitive ethology. So the idea uh, behind all of this is that we, we still understand animals in terms of uh, um, as the ethological effect of think, talking about, for example, um, the hierarchy and all those sorts of things. And that is a, a big legacy because when we talk about animals in terms of hierarchy and we start to say, well, this one's dominant over that, it does lead us into training and thinking about uh, horses in particular and dogs in that kind of uh, expression of dominance. And that narrative has been very strong. Also, in uh, more recent years, we've seen the rise of equitation science and the International Society for Equitation Science, which first began in unpacking horse training. And it really is the, uh, the, the new frontier. Uh, there's a lot more to learn about horses, and we haven't really tapped too much into the cognitive domain. There are some uh, big inroads made into neuroarchitecture with the work of Sebastian McBride and Andy Hemmings, for example, 
We've also explored the four quadrants of operant conditioning. So now we understand training a whole lot better in terms of uh, the recognition of where negative reinforcement fits in, where positive reinforcement fits in and their benefits. But what we don't really know much about is the other side of the coin that basically tells us whether or not our operant conditioning is going to work well or not and what tools we should choose because we don't know enough about what we call the three A's, which are attachment, effective states and arousal. And I'll move on to that a little bit later. In terms of welfare, the horse has always been seen in terms of its utility up until recent times. In, and so our aim in looking after them was to provide as much as we can a better life. And so the five freedoms was a massive step forward where we talked about the importance of being free of hunger and thirst and discomfort and pain and injury and disease and the freedom to express normal behaviors and all of those sorts of things. But then in even more recent times, along came the five domains. And this was a big landmark shift because we're looking at similar domains in terms of nutrition, physical environment, health, uh, behavioral interactions and how they impact mental state or effect. And this is because of the importance that we now recognize of all animals to have a worthwhile life. So we've moved on from just a better life to a more worthwhile life. And this is of course, looking from the viewpoint of the animal, you know, the question is, what is it like to be a horse? And so in probing that, um, I've been delving into philosophy and Thomas Nagel's famous essay in the 1970s is a fascinating one. It's online. And basically he points out that we need to reframe the question a little bit because instead of talking about, he wrote an essay called, what is it like to be a bat? But instead of asking, what is it like to be a horse? He would suggest we should ask the question, what is it like for a horse to be a horse? And that's a fundamentally different question because it removes uh, the human out of the um, equation. So the final element of this welfare is that um, across many countries in, Western, in the Western world, we now see that all codes and all animal industries are subject to the same rising community expectations of good welfare and also the community's reassessment of practices. And this has really been accelerated and driven by social media. And then finally, looking at the horse world, well, that's a little bit complicated because as with all sport, money and medals really make a big difference. And they drive not only trainers and riders to peak performance, but they also may drive riders to sometimes cheat and to morally disengage from the animals that they uh, purport to love. And I'm sure they do, but moral disengagement is a really important element that arises from a more materialist and capitalist view of the horse. Fodder companies, gear companies, uh, companies that sell gear, clothing, um, saddle fitters um, for sponsorship and also veterinary science and natural therapies all vie for their own slice of the commercial pie. Veterinary education still lacks education in cognitive ethology, which is a really um, odd thing. And it's something I find quite uncomfortable because it is a very solid science, the science of ethology. And the horses that vets are dealing with are living animals. They're not dead. And so if you're dealing with a living animal, you really need to know something about how it behaves. And many courses um, have uh, nothing in the way of ethology. And if they do it, they just pay lip service to it more commonly. So people have begun to think differently about welfare. We now see that um, the research and the effects of social media have caused uh, changes in, in uh, use of the whips in racing. So we see now uh, push towards whip free racing. I'm on the uh, uh, the welfare board for racing Victoria here in Australia and doing away with whip is on our strategic plan. Um, also tongue ties and nose bands, hyperflexion, all these issues have been dealt with 
in the last um, 100 years and more recently in the last 20. We've also seen the privileging of positive reinforcement, which is a really important thing because trainers are generally unaware of the great use of positive reinforcement to change, not only change behavior and to desensitize animals to things that they were uh, frightened of, but also just to use to augment the uh, aids that they use in negative reinforcement, the pressure and release of reins and legs, et cetera. And then finally, the and this is the, this is the biggest slide, the specter of climate change is huge. So our big challenge is as we move towards the end of this 100 years in this presentation, what are the real costs and what are our, what are our responsibilities regarding horse ownership and horse sports? Where is our social license and how does this change with the somewhat dystopian prospects of climate change? And so now looking at the next 10 years, what can we expect? Well, if we look first of all at science, we will see that um, science, if, if everything remains the same, we, we don't face some kind of a apocalyptic future, um, science will be more embraced. And it is my hope that we embrace it for what it is rather than cherry pick and show too much cognitive bias and fake news and all of the, those elements of misinformation. Um, because there are so many important factors of peer reviewed science that really could be used and not only to make give horses better welfare, but also to make training more efficient. There are gold medals in using training um, in, uh, in the form of equitation science. Because we know about learning theory, the next big step is about understanding attachment, as I mentioned earlier. And this is where um, we are working as, our, as we speak, we're putting a paper together about the role, roles of attachment, arousal, and effective states in determining the kinds of tools one would use in operant conditioning. There's emerging evidence that mental security is a result of predictability and controllability. And I think that's something that if we look at that in more pedestrian terms, what it basically means is being very clear as a trainer, making sure that every signal you give is understood or at least um, uh, interpreted by the horse in a clear way that these signals are unique and that they just lead to a single answer, not multiple possibilities, because that makes animals confused as it does for humans. And appealing to this, giving the horses this kind of agency where they can give an answer easily and make those kinds of choices leads to resilience and improvements in confidence and, and ultimately attachment. So we, it's in its infancy, this area in science, but we still need to go a lot further. And so it's really a, a, a great and exciting future there. In terms of welfare, I hope that we'll be looking well beyond the anthropomorphic view. And I think the words of Clive Gwynne, the uh, great scientist, the biologist, he talks about, uh, we should really consider whole life considerations for example, not just looking in the spotlight of how a horse is at this moment when we take a photograph of it, but how does it live? What is its whole life like? And can we give it the ability to access its basic and fundamental needs? We also need to understand in the next 10 years the difference between animal rights and animal welfare because they are quite different. And without going into it, because I don't have time, it means that if we do, we'll be able to make much more informed choices. Given the same world, we'll be looking for a better way, so long as social media has a positive focus. And also the uh, interactions of biomechanics and learning, if we get that right, and if we train better, that will also lead to horses having much better welfare. In terms of legislation, um, who knows where that will go, but already that's beginning to happen because ownership is increasingly seen as a privilege rather than a right. Um, what, li what license do we have to do what we do? We call that social license to operate. And that's something really worth thinking about because that appeals to us in all areas that we, in which we deal with horses. How can we best treat horses and uh, allow them to access 
those basic needs? And what rights do we have to do certain things? These are all big questions. So already there are people talking about we need to have a license to own and ride horses. And I do think that is something that will come in because it shouldn't be onerous and difficult, but there are some basic elements that all horse owners should understand about how to train and how to treat and how to manage horses. So we need big improvements there, improvements in veterinary education, improvements in pain diagnosis. We need to be much better at resolving the difference between pain and stress because they have very similar markers. In a sense, pain responses are really um, uh, in, the, in the basket of stress responses. We need to amalgamate ethology with veterinary science. And as I said, that's an improvement in veterinary education. And we also need to continue looking at uh, how we use whips and the relevance of whips. And should we really be instead privileging those trainers who can get the best performance in any discipline with the least amount of weaponry and the least amount of coercion. And so as I move then to the FEI, we also should be looking at those things. How do we produce the best performance with the least amount of coercion? It's a tricky area because in terms of welfare, even the girth to many horses is a pretty inconvenient kind of thing to have around its body. And it's one of those pressures that cannot go away. When you think about it, every other pressure that we provide from the reins and the legs, whip taps, whatever, they all are removed in best practice, but the girth is never removed. So how will we resolve that? Or do we need to? Because I know in my early life where I broke in thousands of racehorses because that's how I fed my family in the 80s uh, in my equestrian centre. I know from breaking in so many horses that some, you put the girth around them and they don't seem to mind one little bit and there's no reaction at all. And they learn uh, very quickly and others have quite acute reactions. So we need to reconsider double bridles if people can still do what they do with uh, normal snaffles. We need to be ahead of the game. And that's the important thing for the FEI in my point of view, they need to be thinking ahead of the game in order to be sustainable because legislation comes very swiftly if we're not, because all of these uh, sports that we have are in high resolution in everybody's bedroom and living room. And so we need to be well ahead of that. We're, there should also be a think tank on the FEI to allow us or enable us to navigate the future for sustainability of horse sports if we really do want to keep them. I think that's very important. And we should be prepared to accept that there will be change, but we will still have them. But we need to do the best as we can for the horse. And so finally, the uh, elephant in the room, that is climate change, as I mentioned earlier. And this IPCC report is quite a, a red flag for us all. We need to seriously think in the ne next 10 years about horse ownership and management and transport, because they're very expensive in terms of elements like uh, carbon, and also expensive in terms of um, the environment and even welfare. We need to consider with all things, uh, in all uh, goods and services, how we might factor in the costs of welfare, carbon and the environment. And as I said, this is part of being ahead of the game. I'm not including the pandemic here because I think just as we did with antibiotics, I think we will have viruses under control because uh, research will dig deeper into messenger RNA transcription and cytology and the weaknesses there. So I do think that's on the horizon, but maybe I'm just a, an optimist. Um, so heading towards sustainability, I think the next 10 years will be the telling years. And so finally, what will we be doing in 100 years? Well, really, I'm just guessing, and this is where I've been having a bit of fun because who knows, it's a crystal ball. Will we move into another era where misinformation is continually privileged or will we move into a more truthful era? As I mentioned in the last slide, I'm hoping that's where we would go. And in the way, in this slide, I hope science becomes more trusted and that this uh, very much impacts into equestrian education. 
But to my mind, we can only move, we can only progress at the speed of trust. We need to gain the trust of the equestrian world. And if we don't have their trust, we stay still. In terms of legislation, in a just world, um, how will we keep horses, as I mentioned? If we attend to the optimal physiological health combined with enabling horses or all animals, but especially horses in this case, to access their ethogram needs, that is their, as we say, their telos or their, their genetic predispositions to behave in certain ways. In other words, allowing them to be socialized um, and not keeping them isolated. Uh, we, we, that's a tradition that we see it a lot in the, particularly in the uh, showing world where they're, they're isolated from each other. Um, if they're turned out, no one wants to see a mark on the horse's body, so they're turned out on their own. But we have much better outcomes, not only as we've seen with the Manchester police, not only in terms of their calmness within the stable, but also in their bravery and their boldness when they're out on patrol. And this is worth thinking about for every horse owner, because just as it is with people, um, isolation is really quite damaging. It's a very serious problem. So we need to think about that. And of course, continuing to think about allowing horses to access their basic needs for foraging. So not just providing hard feed for a um, half an hour twice a day or three times a day, but the constant access at least 13 hours a day to foraging is not just a nutritional need, it is an, a mental need. And if we uh, disable horses from that, if, then we're likely to see increased in stereotypical behaviors. So if the future is not too dystopian and the world is fair and just, we will um, see the real costs and uh, and we will uh, be able to attend to those. Another thing I wanted to mention was uh, the idea of compassionate conservation, which came uh, not so long ago from uh, in 2020. And that concept basically redefines humanity's responsibility towards nature. It emphasizes ethically and scientifically based practices that value animals in terms of their own subjective experiences and their deserving of a, of a life worth living. And Mark Beckhoff has talked about that a lot too. So we'll need to navigate our way through how horses fit into this and what happens also in the future if we're going back to rewilding places, which we probably will, where will horses fit in? In terms of the equestrian world, right now we really don't know whether horses like to be ridden or not, but it's something we're thinking about in the next 100 years because don't forget the way we think may not necessarily be the way our grandchildren think. And the more we delve into the emotional lives of animals, the more we might well show that this, they are perfectly happy to be ridden, or maybe they're not, we don't know. There's a lot of discussion about it. But one thing that's interesting is that it's likely that meat will be uh, laboratory made in the next 100 years because people can al already do that. So when we no longer kill animals for meat, will we still be comfortable riding them? And to me, that's a big question. It's just an interesting philosophical question, but we can't answer that if we already think in that kind of way, because we just think, of course, we will. Maybe 5,000 years of selective breeding of horses has resulted in an animal that is, that's perfectly happy and maybe even really likes to be ridden. These are questions we don't know. And so finally, management. As I said before, how will we keep them? We need management systems that take into consideration the horse's true nature. Um, for example, management of farming systems, uh, such as the uh, work of Jane Myers. Maybe these are the uh, preferred ways of the future to manage horses. Um, we need to enable them to um, access their, uh, all, the, all of their uh, ethogram, including exercise, needs, all of those sorts of things. Um, all of these things, we can only hazard a guess as to how they will play out in the, next, uh, in, the, in the next 100 years. But we shouldn't underestimate the importance of social license because that isn't going away, it seems. And the more people tap the button for likes and dislikes, that is going to tell us 
very largely the direction we will go. And that's why I think the elephant is the canary in the coal mine. Elephant riding is already banned because of social license. Very few people in the Western world ride, go to Thailand to ride elephants. And I've been very heavily involved with elephants. And so that's one thing that I know now you people, people go there for hands-on experience. It's not always the best welfare for the elephants because now they don't get exercise and they paint paintings. Uh, and when they are doing this sort of thing, someone's actually driving the painting anyway. The elephants aren't doing it themselves if it's a scene of a tree and a flower and a, or an elephant, uh, which is another problem in itself. But they're only walking 20 odd meters in many cases just to do this and go back to their chained life. So the point is really simple as far as I'm concerned. We need to modernize or, or perish and um, sustainability is really what we should be all looking at. And we need to all look in that direction and think, how can we do that? And as I said, the FEI needs to create a think tank for this. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you. Wow, you covered so much there. Uh, but we could uh, look forward to unpicking during the panel discussion and, and for the questions. Um, I should have said at the beginning a, a, a special thank you to you because it's well actually now it's past your normal get up time it's half past five isn't it but uh, thank you so much for joining us such an ordinary early hour of the morning um, in your busy schedule so it's, it's gr great to have you but you you covered so much around the science of learning theory about sustainability and climate change in the environment about rewilding something that we often more re recently get comments about and of course about the importance of biomechanics which is a lovely segue into our next webinar um, at the beginning of November so Andrew brilliant uh, lots of questions are starting to come and I'd encourage everyone to use the zoom Q&A function if you see a question that you want to support please just upvote it rather than writing the question again and if you're on Facebook please just put your comment your questions in the comment section. Now, before I introduce the next panellists, um, uh, I'm going to share my screen because we're going to have a second poll question. And this just asks, in general, do horse owners effectively translate concerns about their horse's equine mental well or their horse's mental well-being into improvements into their horse's lives? And obviously, um, Andrew's touched on many of these issues. Either yes, owners generally improve their horse's live, lives as a result of their concerns, or no, owners are generally not effective at improving their lives as a result of their concerns. So whilst you're answering that, um, it's wonderful to see that we've got people, it's a, tr a really sort of global set up tonight or today. We've got people across Europe, Stockholm, Croatia, Russia, the Netherlands, and of course, across the UK, including, including Claire Foot, who's joining us on holiday in West Scotland. We've got people in Canada and the US and in New Zealand and Australia. So a truly global event. And now I just want to introduce our other two panelists. First, John Frank, and many of you will not need any introduction, obviously a hugely successful national hunt jockey, but has turned his skills to many other things as a trainer, as a racing pundit, as an author. Um, he's done some brilliant work with the, uh, the Injured Jockeys Fund, former president, now vice patron. I, I think when I was doing a little research about John, I had no idea that he actually, before he started racing career, he turned down the chance to ride for Harvey Smith. And his, the first owner of the first ride he had, race, racehorse he had, was a guy called Jeffrey Burr, who was a potato farmer, who actually paid him for riding out his horses with sacks of potatoes. How things have changed, or not, as the case may be. So, John, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And then to introduce Caroline, Caroline Hurd from World Horse Welfare, a member of the home team. Um, the, the charity is 93 years old. Um, um, Caroline's been with us for 27 of those years, which is extraordinary, in various different guises, including as a grass sickness nurse up at, at Edinburgh Vet School um, at, at the start. But as you see, she's got a huge amount of experience. One thing you won't know about John is that he's got nothing happier than when he's got a shovel in his hand, which um, he doesn't actually say what he wants to do with the shovel. And one thing you won't know about Caroline, and um, 
uh, having a daughter who's learning to ride I, I, uh, and, and drive, I can completely understand this. She can't sort out her right from her left. So she often has to write left and right on the appropriate hand just to save her from confusion during her riding lessons, which is a wonderful thing. Now, before we kick in to the, um, the uh, discussion panel, uh, Basil, have you got the answer to the uh, uh, poll question? Oh, look at that. Couldn't be closer. Uh, it, it, you're evenly split pretty much on whether uh, horse owners are able to improve their horses' lives as a result of their concerns and not. And so hopefully um, having tonight's webinar um, is really going to help in, in doing that. So I'm going to stop sharing. And now we're going to open into a sort of a, a 20 minute or so structured panel session. And first, I wanted to look about factors that affect it affect equine mental well-being. So Andrew, just a question to you to kick off. To what extent is equine mental well-being affected by a lack of owner of understanding of what horses need and how they learn? You've obviously touched on this, but what, what, how much do you think it is the problem is a simply a lack of understanding? I think it is a considerable lack of understanding because, see, the five domains model of animal welfare is only a very recent thing. And in, it was in earlier times when we thought about utility. And now when we look at, well, how do we make a horse's life better? We need to think about the importance of the horse's needs. And I think of all of them, the one we are worst at is socialization. We forget that it's a social animal, an animal and we forget how crippling that is. I think in terms, I think the veterinary world has made very good inroads into welfare physiologically. So I don't think, we have too many problems there, but I think in uh, that area of welfare, we do need to improve and we'll see, as I said, there's gold medals in this if we can get it right. Um, if people allow horses access to um, other horses, even if the, we just remove the bars in the stable, to me, that's a really big thing. And also getting training right. Um, use it for abandoning the use of punishment after a behavior and particularly for non-compliance, which is common. You know, the horse didn't do something, so you, you smack it. But if we then think more of the aids we use, as people do in very good horsemanship, and at the top levels, I think it, they show it very clearly that you know you use your signals, your pressure on, then that you, you don't keep the pressure on the whole time because it makes no sense to the horse. So I think there are a few areas like that where we really need, we do, do need to improve. Brilliant. John, from your perspective, I mean, how much, I mean, you've obviously heard uh, Andrew talk around, around equine mental well-being, how it's changed over the years. I mean, how much do you think there is an understanding within your world around equine mental well-being? Well, listen, if you haven't got happy horses, then you're going to struggle to get the best out of them. And it doesn't matter whether it's a horse or a child or whatever it is, really. Um, and if you look back years ago, um, people used to keep horses in stalls. Um, and I've been around to plenty of really successful uh, yards where the horses are kept absolutely isolated, completely the opposite to what Andrew said. And I, and I agree with him. They're probably better and happier when they can see other horses. But as race horses, it pretty much comes down to genetics, how fast you are. I mean, all of Fred Winter's best horses were kept in cage boxes. So they were inside a barn, had the hayloft over the top, they were dark, couldn't, had no access to put their head out over the stable into fresh air. All of the best horses at Fred Winter's yard came out of that um, one barn. I remember going to Richard Hannon's a couple of years ago, his best horse was in the darkest stable imaginable. You could hardly see it in the back of the um, stable. So, they, listen, as, a, as an owner or a trainer, you cannot do anything better for your horse than to watch it as closely as you can all of the time. Jenny Pittman's father was an absolute master at it. He'd sit in the yard, watch horses all day, and he'd say to Jenny, that horse isn't happy there. And Clive Cox, who trains here next door to me, they're forever moving horses around within the yard. We've got three barns, um, 30 boxes in each, and so they all can see each other. Um, but some, like human beings, they just don't get on. So you move them around. That one doesn't get on with that one. I've got a little horse down here at the moment. He loves Louis de Parma, who's on one side of him, really indifferent to the horse on the other side. 
and it's and as an owner or trainer you've got to watch them all the time see what they like um and just go with the go with the flow and make life as easy for them as possible that's it's interesting actually andrew isn't it what john said there is that because we often say the importance of equines horses are individuals and therefore it's you know what what, what works for one horse might not work for another so whilst you can create sort of general sort of themes and uh, um, management tools it is so important to look at the individual horse to see how they're they're coping and, and they're feeling would you would you agree with that andrew sorry you're on mute yeah i do agree with that um i think that that's important in any situation to manage the horses according to who they get on with best and that's one thing that they found at the Manchester police is that the um, when the bars came down there was some reshuffling needed uh, which is a great thing because the horses were much happier I think um, we still that we must recognize that horses are social animals there are no horses that are not social they're born they're wired that way and we are too and when we are isolated it's damaging um, so I think we need to enable that as much as we possibly can. And it's not just seeing other horses. Touch is a vital aspect. And we know that uh, it makes a difference because in Manchester, police, the horses could already see each other, but they were definitely bolder out um, on, on the field. Whether it makes a difference to racehorse times, that may be a different story. But I still think that doesn't make any difference to me. I think we should still do the best for the horse as a horse. And if the horse runs uh, best in in a dark stable i think that's still not a relevant argument uh, to me i think we should be just still giving the horse the best best life possible and then our winners will come out of that okay well i'm sure we'll come back to that um C caroline and um, when you talk about barriers and and factors that affect equine mental well-being you know cost is, is always an issue uh, and do you think money plays a role in enhancing or reducing equine mental well-being? I'd say probably both, <laughs> which is a bit of a cop out, isn't it? Um, but I think you know there will be. So if you have a lack of money, then it might not be as easy to put in some of the things which might be able to help your horse's mental health. So you know, for instance, if you have you know maybe just two horses and you can't afford to have a third, if you're taking one horse away all the time. Um, to work if that might cause the other one more stress so you know and things like that or changing your setup so that horses can see each other or can touch each other might not be easy if you don't have money on the other hand if um we might actually start making decisions about uh for the horse if we put a great deal of work on it so if it's a horse which is a high competition horse or a, a very sought after breeding horse we might do things to that horse to protect it um which might actually not be in the interest of the horse's mental health yeah brilliant okay so obviously that's a segue into barriers to widespread appreciation of equine mental well-being i mean um andrew in your view what barriers are there to you've touched on this but what do you think are the barriers to optimizing equine mental well-being i think education i think that to uh, own horses. I do think we need to have some kind of license. I don't think it needs to be onerous, but I think that we need to have some knowledge because it's not good enough to just come into it loving horses and patting them and, um, you know, seeing that they seem to get along with us okay. I think the more we know about them, the better. And um, yeah, I think it's a, just a basic thing of education. I think that would improve the horse's mental world a lot. And as John said, recognize when you are, I don't want to not privilege the importance of horsemanship because knowing the horse well and knowing horses uh, in the practical sense makes a huge difference too, because you get to see the small nuances of their behavior and what you could do. So I think those two things is experience and um, knowledge. Brilliant. And John, this is a picking up on that and developing that. Do you think horse owners generally have the skills to optimise equine mental well-being? No, I think one of the biggest problems I think the horse world is facing at the moment, Rowley, um, is the poor standard of um, riding, basic horse management. Um, too many corners are cut. 
the number of people that I see working with horses wouldn't know how to fit a bridle properly. They, when they're riding, they don't sit up properly so that it's comfortable for the horse. You never see anybody give them a pat or a stroke or very seldom hear people talking to horses. Um, as a rider myself, nine times out of 10, you'll get more out of a horse from giving it a pat on the neck. If you're teaching a young horse to jump, then every now and again, you'll get one that wants to smack around the backside, but they're really few and far between. And it's, it's educating people when they're learning to ride, to sit properly, to ride properly, and realize that what they're on is a living animal. The second you get on a horse, you should be thinking about nothing but what that horse is thinking, where it's putting its feet and what's best for it because left to its own devices. So Mark Prescott always said, every racehorse is programmed to kill itself. And as a trainer, your job is to put the day off uh, for as long as humanly possible. And it's about right, they will get into trouble if you leave them to, to their own devices. So as a rider, I, th I think the basic standard of horse management and riding need to kick up the backside and we need to get back to where people were probably 50 years ago. That's interesting. It's something we often say that, you know, we live in a world, especially in the UK, I'm not sure if it's the same in, in and Andrew in Australia, but there is so much education out there at the moment, you know, we're, you know, and some really good stuff, but yet there has never been so much ignorance either. So it's a, it's a bit of a contrary position, isn't it? Um, Caroline, just picking up on that, you know, do we currently, from, from your perspective, do you think we have the tools that allow horse owners to assess equine mental well-being i think that's some that's an area that really needs some some really good work some just basic where can i put my horse on a scale you know how can i tell if my horse you know it's got good mental well-being if it's if it's in trouble um i think there are some things that you know things are definitely developing and coming out which are really helpful like behavioral ethograms over pain um the the really you know, good training things, which Andrew's alluded to, um, you know, that with the positive and um, negative reinforcement um, conditioning uh, and, and shaping your horse to the right behaviour. I mean, you know, those are really great. And I think having the open mind, like we've all, you know, grown up in the horse world, and I think there's loads of, like, it's a very traditional world, isn't it? It's like, this is the way that we do things. And once you've got set into that, it can be quite difficult to actually take that sit back and go, well, yeah, I have been doing this for 20 odd years or 30 years, um, but maybe it would help to bring this in. And I think if you can keep that open mind and try these things, you can actually really, you know, see some positive results and, and the benefit of change. Yeah, it's interesting because, as you say, that yeah, it's actually knowing what the normal is, isn't it? And and a lot of this is is not it's not rocket science because the, the basic horsemanship is something we've all all grown up with. And you know, we it's so easy to know. You know, you should know what your horse's normal temperature, pulse, and respiration is, so you'll be much better able to know when it's abnormal. And it's exactly the same with their mental state, isn't it? Just being able to know what is normal for them, and then you'll be much better to, to able to assess when it's not normal. Um, brilliant. Well, listen. Then let's just think about uh, Andrew touched on this, um, and this is quite a difficult question when we think about equine mental well being now and in the future. And I might um, ask all three of you, but what three things should every horse owner do to improve their horse's mental well being? It's the kind of question we should be finishing on. But, um, John, I'm going to come to you first. What, what do you think, in your experience, things that horse owners should be doing? Rowley, it's what Andrew said earlier. It hasn't changed and it won't change in 100 years time. They're basic creatures. They want to be well fed, well watered and be comfortable and free of pain. And it won't change in a thousand years. That's all a horse wants. And it was interesting what he touched on. He said, you know, look, um, what does a horse think about being a horse? Well, to an extent, I go along with that. But it's also a little bit like people with their kids. You know, if you're a kid, you know, what does, what does my child think of being a child? Well, left to his own devices, most of them would lay in bed until 11 o'clock. They'd eat um, poorly, they'd watch TV, they'd go to bed, bed late and basically be a pain in the ass. <laughs> well, I don't want a horse like that. I don't, so I don't want a kid like it either. So you've got to educate, you've got the brains, you've got to educate horses to behave how you want them to be and make their life comfortable, and interesting what he was saying about the girth as well. Basically, 
you will get more out of your horse, the better you treat it, the more comfortable it is and the happier it is. But you won't have any fun out of your horse if it hasn't got good manners and does what you want to when you want to do it. OK, maybe okay. in the interest of time, I, I know Carol and Andrew want to chip in on that, but maybe we'll come back to that later. Um, uh, Carol, one for you. What, what makes you hopeful the future, for the future in terms of equine mental well-being? I think for me it would be um, the amount and breadth of the research that's around horse welfare at the moment. There just seems to be so much coming forward, um, like, I, certainly more so than I've been aware, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, I think that people are talking more of a partnership with horses rather than perhaps seeing them as a chattel. Um, you know, so, so I, I, those things really give me hope. Um, I think people generally want to give their horse the very best, but it's really easy to slip into, you know, conflicting, you know, sort of training or confusion that way. So, yeah, but I think, you know, certainly the things that are coming out at the moment really give me hope that we're on a really great track to improving horse mental health and, and welfare together. Brilliant. Thanks, Caroline. And Andrew, what, what are we generally getting right now um, in terms of equine mental well-being, do you think? I think it's education we're getting right now. I think we people are, are becoming more educated. I think that's one of the good things about uh, social media. There's a lot about it that I don't like and I don't uh, enjoy engaging with it. If there's a negative aspect to it. Like I said, it's like the Wild West of media. But I think that social media also is uh, very educational and it prompts people and motivates people to know more. And um, those discussions that people have, I think, about horses are really important, um, you know, for... Uh, to improve education. So I, I do believe education is the, the key. We need to improve our education. Uh, I think we're still a, not a great point. Even as I said, veterinary education needs to be improved so that includes ethology or otherwise known as animal behavior, principles and le understanding learning. Uh, but, it's all, but it's coming. Um, I, see, I see the language being used. I've helped a few people in England, for example, Richard Davison and, um, uh, and a few, few others uh, around the world with dressage. And I notice that the ones who are really good thinkers tend to take it on and they are big uh, advocates. And that because they're known people and respected, um, people really listen to them. And so I see it filtering down it, just in the language people use, uh, I, I, I see a lot of promise there. Brilliant. Listen, thank you. Now um, we're going to, anyone would think we'd rehearse this because we're dead on time. We're going to go into the open Q&A now. And, and thank you so much. Lots of questions coming in. Um, and please do, as, as mentioned earlier, if you're on Zoom, please do upvote those questions and they'll come to the top of the list. But we'll get through as many as we can. Now, one of the questions that was towards the top of the list um, and uh, not surprisingly is um, from, from Facebook. Um, and I'm going to give it to you, John, what effect on horses' mental well-being does using a whip for training or for encouragement or correction have? Oh, um, well, well, listen, I would always recommend that you ride out with a whip. Um, for no, I mean, I, I, I've ridden out with a whip every day in my life, and the number of times I pick it up and use it riding out, I could count on probably one hand. But every now and again, you'll be going down the road. There'll be a car coming one way. You need to have your whip on the outside just in case the horse decides to shy out. A pure safety thing. It might not go anywhere, but if it goes to go one way, you need the whip to give it a kick. You've got your leg, but you need a whip. Make it come back in. Racing, you need a whip just in case the horse goes to run out. It's not probably the end of the world uh, these days if it does run out. Uh, but years ago, there were concrete posts and six by six wooden posts on the wings of the fences. Um, so you certainly need to carry a whip. But if you watch um, a, a, a flat race or a jump race, um, probably see it more jumping where they're going around the inside um, and the open wing is on the left. So you should have your whip in your left hand. I can guarantee you that four out of 10 jockeys will have their whip in their right hand. So if it goes to run out, it's absolutely useless. So they might not as well be carrying a whip. 
when it comes to hitting a horse to go faster, 99.9% .9 of them do their best. And if you took the opportunity to use the whip away, you would definitely get a better standard of riding, better finishes. Jockeys would have to grip better with their legs, push them from the, um, from the, from the waist down and keep, they would keep in a straighter line. And the number of people say to me, well, you know, that would have won if he'd hit it with, with, with a whip. And I say, well, but the second one wouldn't have been hit with a whip either. Um, where, in which other sport can you break the rules, which you can in racing, anywhere in the world now, you can break the rules and still keep the prize. It's an absolute joke. And why we haven't had anybody in the last 15 years strong enough um, running the BHA to say, we're going to stop using the whip now and forget what they're doing anywhere else in the world is completely beyond me. Um, Nick yeah. Russ didn't do anything. Um, the person before him didn't do anything. And the woman in charge now won't do anything either. Well, to be, to be fair, we could debate the whip all night, could we? But to be fair, the BHA, there is a consultation going on at the moment. and, and actually, they've, been cons they've been thinking about that for years, Rowley. Yeah. Well, let's they'll be bring fair. It down to, they'll bring it down to you're only allowed to use it twice. That's the most they could actually come to do. Well, we, we, we shouldn't prejudge it, but it is a, po a point to note that there is a public consultation that the BHA are running at the moment. So do go on to their website and, uh, it, and, and respond to that because there is, there is an opportunity uh, uh, to, 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 to make a change at the moment. So thank you for that, um, um, John, because I know it's a, it's, a, it's a very emotive issue and, and one where there's, people have lots of different views. Well, um, is it, I'll tell you what it's like, Rowley. Uh, Andrew was saying earlier about them stopping riding elephants. Well, it's a slightly different thing with horses because you'd struggle to keep an elephant in your back garden because they do an awful lot of damage. But they need to preempt this and say, right, this is what we're doing. It's not right that we're sitting in 2021 and we're still hitting horses that are doing it with whips that are trying their hardest. Mark Johnston, the trainer, is trained more winners than anybody else. He said a little while ago, the whip is like going along a hedgerow and shaking the um, hedge to make the birds fly up. The jockey is sitting on the horse. He doesn't need a whip to make the birds fly up. He's actually sitting on it so he can push it and scream at it and do what he likes, but don't hit it. Thank you. Caroline, a very different question now from Stephen, but the most popular. What is the mo most effective way to co communicate new research findings to the equestrian communities in a way that they affect positive change? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, well, I think obviously what we can all do to promote it is really important, but I suspect it would be to get um, some of our um, sort of great riders on board and, and doing it because people tend to copy celebrities. Right, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, Andrew, there's a question um, from um, from Facebook and th there's quite a lot of interest in just a little bit more detail about the changes made to the Manchester Police Stables. Okay, oh. Hang on, I think I'm mute. I'm no, no, you're, you're, you're good, you're good, yep. Good. Yes, um, so I've been working with the Manchester Police for a number of years, um, facilitated by uh, Lisa Ashton, and um, I basically worked on getting the training better um, because, and going back to real basics and not worrying about whether the horses were on, you know, round in a, a rounded outline as we would want maybe for dressage, because there are elements of that that can, can confuse horses. So going back to just really soft riding, and um, we did that, and they were pretty happy, and they were very good at sticking to that. But there were still some problems. So I thought we really got to venture into this other world of uh, giving them more socialisation. And I suggested it to uh, Mima Manning, who's the head there at the riding there. And um, luckily, uh, I found a person who was really willing to give it a go. And so they decided to pull the bars down and they saw quite dramatic changes. In the first week, there was a lot of noise, of course. We did the same thing with elephants. We took the chains away in the places where I work in Southeast Asia. So the results were identical. Um, a lot of noise in the first, a lot of argy-bargy. And then after that, everything changed. The stables were much quieter. They moved the horses, as John mentioned, so that they were 
you know, with friends, um, with ones that they did like, and um, they were, the horses were braver out on patrol. And I did say to Mima, please tell me any negative aspects as well as the positive. The negative aspects were only in the first week. Um, after that, it was all positive. And it makes sense, you know, because we are social animals. That's one of the reasons we uh, are attracted to horses, not just because we can sit on them, on them and do what we want, but like elephants, they're social. And because of that, we need to think about them in terms of their social lives. So that's what happened at Manchester. And I'm, I'm really so proud of them. It was a, a great, brave move and, and they did it. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, John, we've had a question from Lee Mosset at the Racing Post, who you'll know well, and he refers to an interview you did with Gay Waterhouse, uh, the, the leading Australian racehorse trainer. It was a few years ago, but she said to, to um, Lee that people in, in our part of the world, in Europe, were far too keen to put horses bo in boxes, literally and metaphorically, and, and she believes that they felt they spend far too much every time each day in their box. In, in some yards, it can amount to 22 or 23 hours a day. Can that possibly be a good thing for mental well-being of an animal who would by, not by nature be trapped by four walls? Well, I think if they're in um, stables where they um, can see other horses, um, then it's perfectly acceptable. You'd be amazed. You turn, but some trainers will train horses out of a field over here. And of course, we're governed a lot by the climate. We don't have, you know, the sunshine that they have in Australia, where you can turn them out into a sand pit afterwards, and they're going to be um, absolutely um, okay, and they're not going to get rain rash or anything else. Uh, Gordon Elliott, who's come in for any amount of criticism over the last six months. Uh, but whatever you say about him, he's forward thinking in terms of looking after animals. His horses have access to either go out or stay in, even when it's typical Irish weather and it's pouring with rain. And they'll happily stay out um, in the rain some days and some of them will stay in the stables. They're, they're all different. But I think providing, and you, you know, I've, I've got a, um, a horse here at home and he's, he's a very good example of what we're talking about. I've tried turning him out in a, in a pen to begin with. Um, he doesn't settle. He doesn't settle if he's in a pen and somebody's in another pen not far away. I've put him in a paddock. He's nearly dug a ditch around the head of it because he's not happy. Put him back in his stable, perfectly happy as long as he's got his horse next to him that he gets on with. Brilliant, mm. thank you, okay. No, just, um, Andrew, sorry, yeah. Um, I, just, I think there's, there's this um, you know, general, general belief that you know, we need to have them all boxed at high levels for competition, but just an interesting thing two weeks ago, the Bundes champs in Germany are the biggest young horse championships in the world, and my son lives in Germany. My daughter-in-law, uh, she, uh, the pony side is also very big, as it is with the you know normal sized horses, and she was she's just one with a horse called Dexter M, a pony. She was sixth in the in the Bundes champs in a with a pony. The, all the others were in stables and had been stable, but they didn't. They just had the pony in a paddock with other horses, and he was sixth. And basically, he just didn't quite move as well as the others. But he won all of these levels to get there. And I think um, I was really pleased that they did that because it is really possible to think that way and you get a happier animal. Brilliant, thank you. Could I just- Harley, Harley, Harley Smith, when he was training for us, he used to turn, take the back shoes off them and keep them literally in a herd, in a box. But they're ju it's just difficult to manage. It just doesn't work with racehorses. When they're really fit and well, all they want to do is be, you know, particularly if you've got colds, they'd be fighting each other and they're a, you know, they're a pain. But I agree with Andrew, you know, if you can keep things out and exercise ponies from the field, then, and you know, they're out with their mates, then it's much better. And basically, that's when we grew up, that's what we did. We used to turn the ponies out in the field. Uh, they'd be out with three or four others, bring them in on Friday night, um, give them a wash, take them to the gym car, and we'd ride them all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and then they'd be back out in the field again. Um, and, mm. You know, then as you get older, you just realise that it's, you know, certainly with racing, it's, it's an impossible way of going on. Yes, I suppose regular exercise is, 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 is a good thing. Um, uh, Caroline, um, you were going to chime in then. Yeah, can I just, um, I'd obviously I can only talk from my own experience. I'm having worked 
there in other places, but I would say really horses that um, have been in a lot tend to have to be much more difficult to handle. Um, and they do show like quite a lot more behavioral signs of having had problems being in so much. Um, we, you know, we've, we get so many horses here of all different types um, and we're able to manage all of them living out 24 seven through Scottish winters, you know, spring, summer, everything. I mean, we, you know, I, you know, I think it's like, it's really important to, to not just go with what the traditional ways are and to actually maybe put the horse first if you can. Thank you, Gary. And picking up on that, and obviously challenging the status quo is a broader theme around that, isn't it? But uh, Claire has asked, uh, and obviously a lot of horses in the UK and in many other countries around the world are kept in livery yards, but the, uh, her livery yard has restricted turnout over the winter. And can you give advice about how you can manage uh, their horse's mental well-being over the winter? Caroline. Sorry. Yeah, obviously, you know, that's that's where it gets difficult, isn't it? When when you do have those restrictions that you can't just do what you'd like to do. So um, I would say, going back to what Andrew was saying, if there's ways that you can change the stable so they can get contact, um, definitely being able to see each other as much as possible. And to get them out as much, if you can take them out hacking together, you know, it's, it's a break from just being stood within four walls. Um, if they could be turned out in like an arena, um, you know, for... For 30 minutes or something just to let them stretch have a run around have a bit of a play you know you do have to be careful obviously you know that horses get on when they're in the smaller areas but just any kind of extra movement anything you can do just to give them a bit more interest than than just being in those four walls i think is it will really help very much picks up on the the freedom of the three f's isn't it or freedom friends and forage that, that's Ro great. Romany, can i can i yeah, say, yeah. can i follow on from that there's Absolutely. A very good trainer in Newmarket called Clive Britton, and he had a very good filly called Pebbles, who he took to America. And she didn't like being on her own. Um, and so he took a mirror and he put a mirror up in the in the horse box. He put the mirror up in the uh, crate when she was traveling and she had the mirror when she got there. Um, and it might be an idea. Anybody who's got a horse, you know, we've always said all evening is how you know, they're um, herd animals, they like to be others, but if you've just got one horse, and a lot of people only have one horse, it might be an idea um, to just try putting a mirror up for them. Well, and Andrew, just picking up on that, Jennifer has asked a series of questions, which I won't be able to get uh, through all of them, or, but I'll certainly ask this one, and it picks up on what John's just said. Does the equine industry draw experience and ideas from animal, other animal welfare areas, such as environmental enrichments of um, techniques used in zoos? To some extent they do, but I think that the horse area is still a long way behind other, other animals. For example, positive reinforcement is seen as uh, a, a, just a way of teaching horses tricks and a fun thing to do, but actually delving into the area of positive reinforcement makes a huge difference to the animal's life and also uh, makes training much more efficient. Um, it can make things much clearer to horses. They can achieve responses more quickly. So I think um, it's, there are a lot of areas where we can really improve in that way. Sorry, did I, did I answer your question? I got a bit sidetracked, but I, did I? Um, no, it was, it was really, yes, it was really about environmental enrichment in zoos. Yeah, um, I, yeah, yeah, to me, that's uh, a really big part of it is the, uh, you, you know, utilising positive reinforcement. I should also say that, you know, in the old days when we had the long format of eventing, and that's when I was eventing in, um, at, a, at the top level in Australia, all my horses were in the paddock. I only brought them in for stabling. I lived in Tasmania too, so it's a pretty cold, bleaker place than where I'm living now. Um, and I had them, I just had them rug, but uh, they're in the paddock and they're with other horses. And um, I just think there's a mental barrier for that. Um, I think there's still a possibility in racing to do it, but we're just not there yet. And no, because no one's, the top ones haven't done it and haven't tried it, doesn't mean that it's not possible. I think there are so many areas we need to look at uh, and open up and modernise and think outside the square. And it's all out there. And we, there's a lot we can learn from other trainers. Dog trainers, for example, are well ahead of us in the way they uh, use uh, in reinforcement. And, you know, we're only just 
getting there. In fact, when I first began my PhD, it wasn't even thought of. It was, uh, I, I didn't realize it was a, a new area, but it, it certainly was. It, you know, it's, it's very traditional and classical, the horse world. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, Caroline Myers asked, considering the results in the research, why are the dominance theory as a behaviour theory and punishment as a training method still so, so prevalent in the equestrian world? I think possibly, again, it comes to that tradition. It's what we've done. We've had success doing it. Um, but just because you've succeeded in, in one way, um, if the horse has been affected by that in a, in a not so good way, is that okay? So I think it comes back to having that open mind. So just because we've always, always done things one way, what about having a look at trying a different way and, and seeing if we can incorporate that? And just being really honest about, um, you know, about, you know, what you're succeeding at and what you're maybe not succeeding at. Um, and also being honest about, you know, you know, sort of, there's quite a lot of normalization of what I would call unwanted behaviors. Oh, he just does that. Oh, yeah, he just does that. He, he, he has a few bucks when I get on him, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and actually, that's not normal. That's not what we should be looking for in horses. So we should be looking for horses that are willing and happy to do the task and understand what's been asked of them. So I think that's where we really need to shift Yeah. in our yeah. approach. Thank you, Karen. Um, John, I don't know, did you watch much of the Olympics? And more specifically, did you watch the modern pentathlon? I did, yes. And, and so I'm going Claire's back asked... to just what Caroline was yeah, saying. Sorry, yeah. Well, well only, only briefly. Again, it boils down to knowing your horse. Some horses buck first thing because they're just incredibly well and want to get on with it. Some will buck because they've got a back problem. And it goes back down to knowing your horse. Yeah, going back to the pentathlon, um, I'm not actually sure who sourced the horses. And I did feel sorry for the German girl because she obviously trained incredibly hard and got, got a horse who just didn't want to be there. And we've all had horses like that for whatever reason. Most, most horses start stopping and don't want to um, be uh, going into a ring competing for one reason. It's because they've had somebody riding them who probably been trying to jump something that's too big, had no idea about getting them onto a nice stride and has put them time and again into a position where they're completely unsure of what they're meant to be doing. And you don't have to do that for too long before a horse pulls up stuff. So I, listen, I could see it from both sides. From a horse welfare point of view, it didn't look good at all. The horse could not, he might as well have had a plaque around his neck saying, I am incredibly unhappy didn't even look comfortable, he looked like he was hurting somewhere, might have had sore shins, and it wasn't any, any fun for the girl riding him either. It was a really horrible spectacle. No, it absolutely was that, and it'll be interesting to see if any results, changes come as a result. Um, Caroline, the question here about... Sorry, just, Andrew, go ahead. Um, look, just there, there are changes that are uh, already happening in modern pentathlon. They're really reviewing it. I'm a member of modern pentathlon because I was a tetrathlon competitor, which is everything bar fencing up until COVID. Um, and there are uh, big changes happening because of this. It's caused a major thing, which it should have too. But in saying that too, you know, um, one of the things that um, I did notice is that that's the sort of thing that you still see at your local competition. You know, it's not as if that never happens in dressage or jumping or racing or wherever, that is still what we need to improve. It's not just something that happened to happen in pentathlon. It's, it's, it's just a symptom of where we, how far we need to go. Absolutely. And it's just very unfortunate. It was just sort of a global in its nature of... Yeah. of Ro it, Roly, should we, have, should we have something on a happier note? Yes, go on, go for it. So we've been talking about horses and trying to keep them occupied. And Andrew was saying about them, you know, having something to eat for um, 13 hours a day. Hay nets, they get their feet stuck in them. They're probably at the wrong angle. I have just finished making a little hay feeder and I've got a picture of it somewhere if Basil can pop it up. And it's very simple. Anybody can know that's the one of the stables. There's a, <laughs> you've got a hay, 
There it is. Very simple to make. It's got three bed springs down on the bottom of it. It's got a flat metal panel. You put the hay in and the hay is fed. It's continually pushing against the grill, keeps horses amused all day long. And it's Great. like picking grass for them. Andrew, do you want to make a comment yeah. on that? I think that's a wonderful idea. I think that's the sort of thinking we need is how do we en enable this? If people say, well, I'm not giving him a horse hay because of the, the hay net problem, well, there it is solved. So it's a good yeah, example. Wonderful. That. That's, thank you, John. There's a first bit of uh, innovation I think we've ever bit, had. Bit, bit more uplifting, Rory. Let's get on to a positive note, yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the, the next question, I don't have any control of the questions, but they're brilliant questions. But Tina Caroline has asked about, we've obviously mentioned about whips, but what do panellists think of the use of spurs? Uh, dress our horses at high levels seem to seem unfazed by spurs but is that just habituation or a case of being obedient so or, or or a case of being obedient removes the punishment of a nudge from the spur um i think i think whatever you're using a an aid it's supposed to be an aid it's not supposed to be for punishment um so if you're using you know whips or spurs or whatever else you come across um, as a punishment, that is, that's not a healthy way to train a horse. Um, I, I can't say whether the, the dressage horse is habituated to it um, or not, because I haven't really been involved in, in that horse's training, so it's quite difficult for me to judge the general, if that makes sense. Um, but I would just say, you know, um, personally, I wouldn't use spurs because I'm not a good enough rider. So I think I think you have to be really honest with yourself and with your abilities. And I would worry that I would use it inadvertently. Um, but that was just my personal feeling about it. That's a really interesting comment. You wouldn't use spurs because you're not a good enough rider when many people would use spurs to make them a better rider, possibly. But uh, um, that's a really thank you. That's a that's a really insightful comment. Um, there's a question from Maya here, uh, Andrew, who's asked, um, could you explain a bit more about the, the three A's, attachment, arousal and effective state? Well, yeah, I can. Uh, arousal is, you know, uh, a really important element that you know, the horse is either very sleepy or it's highly aroused. And it has different forms and different um, instinctive drives. But generally, that's what it's about. So, for example, if you're using positive reinforcement, um, and the horse is too highly aroused, which often they are when you're using it, then uh, use a feed, feed treat that's actually um, of lower value. So the horse isn't so highly aroused. If the horse is um, low, uh, if, in terms of attachment, uh, I think that's an outcome of arousal and effective states in that um, the more the, the bond becomes better if we train them better that's pretty much I think uh, what anyone would say that you know if we train well the whole we have a better bond but that other one effective states is a really important one because it's not just about emotional states it's also about how the horse sees the world in terms of being optimistic or pessimistic in other words it's training background if it has a history of poor reinforcement in other words for example spurs that go on all the time and the horse has habituated to it, which is a very, it is a common thing in, in dressage, unfortunately. Um, not at the necessarily at the top level, but in the, in the average level it is. When the horse habituates to those things, what starts to happen, it affects his mental states. They, he starts to develop negative mental states. And that is, they start to shut down a bit and they don't try anymore. Um, and in other words, it, it's like a judgment by, bias test. They uh, give up, trying to resolve problems because basically problems haven't worked in the past and all of those things uh, go into a, um, making the horse have either a good bond with us or not and so those three A's are really vital and that's a paper that we're working on right as we speak uh, I'm, I'm co-author with a paper um, as a an addition to the five domains paper which we published last year which was the uh, first time now human uh, horse interactions have been included in that five domains model. That was only last year. So, you know, it's all, all quite new. Could I also just mention, with, with the whip thing, I don't think we need whips at all in racing. I think it, it's, it's just we need to move past that. There'll still be winners. And basically, 
I know from breaking in over a thousand horses when I was younger, as I did for a living, that you know, when you pull the right rein, the horse turns right. When you pull the left rein, the horse turns left. Every rider does that. And if a, an event rider is galloping towards a skinny fence and the horse starts to veer left, he's going to pull the right rein. It's just what you do. They're, for, they're your fundamentals of steering. If you teach the horse to steer well, steer, steer well, you won't need the whip for corrections of steering. Whips, nobody uses whips to teach a horse to turn. Like you, you don't see breakers going, tapping on the shoulder with no reins. You always make it an addition to the reins if, they, if it is used. So from my point of view, you don't need to. And what's more, when I was the behavior consultant for Peter Hayes, up until he died in a plane crash, he was the leading trainer in Australia, and I'm not taking any credit for that at all myself, but I was his behavior consultant. We, we changed the protocol there um, with his horses in South Australia, where he would put them on the track every day and he'd get the rider to open the right rein, turn right, open the left rein, turn left, and just do a few wiggly lines to reinforce to the horse without turning. And that meant you could also remove the lugging bits out of the horse's mouth, which is a big ring that jockeys often hang on to, to keep the horse straight. You know, this is ridiculous for us in the performance horse world, because we would never be thinking you do that. We would think you teach him to go straight. So, you know, I think there's some, um, I, I, I think, I don't think whips are necessary. I, I don't see how you can inflict pain to make a horse safer. I think it's um, going, it's by and large going to be uh, worse. And so I just think it's outdated and ridiculous. We don't belt children to make them safer anymore. <laughs> Better. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Steady on now. Steady on. Right. Listen, uh, thank you so much for all your questions. Can I just yeah. say one thing there, Roly? Yeah, go for it, John. I'll let Andrew be going 30 mile an hour around, around Newbury Racecourse on a horse and it decides it wants to duck out and go back into the stable yard and see what happens when he pulls the left rein. I believe me, you're much happier if you've got a whip in your right hand to stop it going. Right. We, yeah, we, 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 we'll we'll have another session. Through. We'll have, another, we'll, okay. <laughs> we'll have another session. Um, listen, um, thank you so much to everyone for all your questions. We, we're fast running out of time. Um, so I just want to, to turn to each of the panellists and say we've had a brilliant discussion tonight, touched on a lot of topics, many of which we could have devoted the whole evening to. But Caroline, having heard everything we have, what, what are your final thoughts? What would your take home message be from this discussion? I, I think, um, oh my gosh, I don't know what to think. <laughs> I mean, it's, like this, it's such a massive, massive topic, isn't it? And it affects everything we do with horses. So watch this space. I think we're going to learn so much over the next few years, and I think it's kind of exciting. And be open-minded. Yeah, be open-minded. It's really Absolutely. <laughs> John, what, 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 what are your final thoughts? I think it's just life in general, really, isn't it? Put yourself in the other person's place. Put yourself in the horse's place. What's he thinking? What's going to be best for him? Um, and you won't go too far wrong. Treat them as individuals. Um, thank you, John. Um, and Andrew, what are your final thoughts? Um, keep learning. Don't stay still. I think so. And learn... and. Learn, go everywhere to learn like realize that, the, that it's you know go beyond just learning about um, horses look at um, how other animals are trained look at what we can do to make an animal's life better think about the animal not as if it's a human being but think of it from its own point of view think about what it's like for a horse to be a horse I love that quote. That's excellent. What a, what a great place to finish and very uplifting too. Listen, um, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. And, listen, and a huge thank you to our three panellists, to, to Caroline, to joining us from, from Bellway, to John. It's great to see you as always. Um, if you're ever short of an auctioneer, John, I can assure you, is an outstanding auctioneer uh, at, at any auction you've got coming up, uh, charity <laughs> auction. And Andrew, a special thank you to you, especially for joining us um, at, at such an early hour. It's now 6.30 in the morning with you. Um, and uh, so it, it, the day has just started. But listen, thank you very much to that. Thank mm -hmm. you to everyone for joining us again. Just a reminder, our next uh, webinar is going to be on um, 
Wednesday, the November the 3rd, and we'll get back into a fortnightly rhythm from, from then. Um, and that is with R Russell mckechnie on uh, from uh, Centaur Biomechanics. On, um, and so we really look forward to seeing you then. But it just remains me to say thank you uh, on behalf of World Horse Welfare and the University of Nottingham for joining us. Um, I always get so excited by the seasons in the, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously coming out of summer for what it's been. But what's very exciting is that I'm an Englishman and a passionate England supporter. And for once in a while, today was a good day for England at the cricket. What a better way to finish than that. But thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you in November. Take great care in the meantime. Thank you very much. Well, hello, Rowley. Goodbye to Andrew. Bye, Caroline. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.